They don't have to die. You're going to oh, put I your glasses on there. You don't need them. We no, don't, don't have to read them. anything. No, I can see you very well. Unless you're looking for the dates that you're working here, but <laughs> I think we settled it. I think we might did, have yeah. to buy a paper. You're not going to get a lot of info that way out of us tonight. Can we talk about the Velvet Underground and, and when you first started that group and how it all came about, how innovative it, it was? Well, however innovative it was, it never, it never lived up to its promise. No. I mean, it, I mean, it took maybe about a couple of years to put the band together, then to get to the point where we were ready to record. Mm -hmm. And between the time that we had all the material and the time that we met Andy, there was, there was a little period there that we put yeah. a, a mixed media thing together. Yeah. Uh, the importance of the band was that it was part of a milieu in New York at the time. There was, uh, there was a very uh, ferocious uh, avant-garde atmosphere where everybody was running around being very busy and developing all sorts of film, video, uh, radical filmmaking. Yeah, yeah. That involved Yoko Ono and Nam Jun Paik and, and a lot of people from Korea who were somewhat rabid Maoists. Mm -hmm. In the political right. sense, right. and but but all of this was was thrown into a milieu of, of, of creating music, and somewhat along the line, everything tended to get confused, and it was important to put music with visual, yeah, visual scenes. And so Andy came along, and and he was looking for someone, a, a band to come and put his visual ideas behind. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had already written all the music and we were ready to record. Right. So he came out and looked at and saw heroin and he saw all this depravity going on on stage and he said, <laughs> hell, you know, you it's can't put, let put this celluloid. Yeah, get lost in the shuffle. Really? And um, so we put on the, the, the Exploding Plastic Inevitable that is still, to my, in my mind, is still one of the most extraordinary experiences. I mean, extraordinary shows that I've ever seen. I mean, yeah. I haven't seen, I haven't seen a, a, a a mixed media show that, that even approaches them. So what happened to Velvet Underground? What, what brought it all to an end? Or was it just that you weren't going as quickly as you thought or whatever? Well, MGM kind of kind of made a decision about where they were gonna, where they were going to put their promotion money. Yeah. They said, okay, well, we've got Frank Zappa and we've got the Velvet Underground. Velvet Underground has Andy Warhol. All of Frank Zappa has is us. And so we're not going to promote Velvet Underground. Right. However, uh, the band went out on the road and developed a whole different style of playing. It wasn't based on like hard work and musical, a certain amount of musical uh, extrapolation. It was, it was, uh, it really turned into a road band. That was a drag. It was right. just a, it was just uh, And so was it you that called it a day or? No, I mean, we weren't spending as much time working on the music. Mm -hmm. So you just decided to? Let it all go. Nobody could see eye to eye anymore. How did you meet up with Jonathan? Uh, many years later, after, after uh, working with Nico and with uh, Iggy, uh, I went to work for Warner Brothers as, as uh, A&R. And someone, some two people showed up in the office one day. I would, my job was to sit there behind a desk and screen all the, all the, all the material that was being presented. And uh, like <laughs> yeah, and it, it was it actually was interesting because I came up with an idea for hits from the trash basket that was going to be like Warner Brothers' right. worst hits. Yeah, take them out and, and let just them take the most you know volatile stuff that you can find. <laughs> and but these two gentlemen from Boston kept showing up and saying, "This is Jonathan Richmond. This is Jonathan Richmond." I had no idea that Jonathan and I had met many years before, mm -hmm. and. Um, But what was interesting about the tapes that were presented was that they were very, very slender. They were not aggressive. They were very weak. I mean, there was a definitive weakness about the music. And this weakness kept on developing and developing until it was still Full just a weak anemia. <laughs> Full fledged anemia. And it's a prime example of how you turn weakness into strength. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Which is like a, a promotion machine. It's a strength. Machine. I mean, it's not a weakness. Anymore. Coming out of your office, though, it was like a promotion machine. You would twist that to make it commercial? No. No? No, there's no way of doing that. Right. It, there, there was no way of actually handling it. I mean, I never got to find out that anyway. 
I mean, you're asking me to make a decision about something that, mm -hmm. you know, I had no control over. Yeah. But I mean, what the music was about was that there was this, this music being presented that was extremely anemic and was highly unlikely to be successful. But because the assumption was made that it was not going to be successful, yeah. it, it was right. successful. Gotcha. How did you feel about that at the time, being told that you were musically anemic, but uh, you would be successful? No one told me. Oh, that you didn't I was actually spill it out. No, I but uh, you. no. The modern lovers, then uh, you're now working continuously with them. Why didn't you bring them to Australia with you? Because uh, we were given two plane tickets, so uh, that's why. That's why. <laughs> did I get them I brought Gail with me. So you, your wife came. Yeah. So now the band are back there. Will you go back and automatically uh, go straight back onto the road with them? Or yeah, it's not that we've been playing frequently because we haven't. When we can, when I can afford to take them, mm -hmm. I bring them. Sure. And when I can't, I just show up alone. You, John, have mixed with and, and been friends with a whole lot of people, like Iggy Pop, as we mentioned, Lou Reed, uh, Bowie. Have you ever had connection with him in business? In business, no. I mean, it was, uh, it was more like a throwaway night, spent writing songs. I mean, what are those sort of, sort of people like to, I mean, Iggy was here a couple of weeks ago, and he seems like he'd be a terrific fellow to work with when you first met him. Yeah. Was he easy or Very hard? easy. It was, I mean, the album was all, was completely, was completed in 10 days. Uh -huh. I mean, Jonathan was very easy to work with, but the album that, that we worked together with was done in two and a half, three days. And, um, Bob is just a gentleman. He's, yeah. a, he's a star. And... Jello Biafra, who's coming on shortly from yes. the Dead Kennedys. Do you, yeah. you know of him? I know of him. Uh, have you known him a long time? No. Never met him. <laughs> okay. Can you do a number for us? Absolutely. Thank you. What, what's the title of this one? Is this Chinese, Chinese Envoy? Envoy? Okay. Envoy. Chinese Envoy, and then we'll come back and we'll throw to a clip. But right now, John Kay. Thank you, John. <laughs>
The Chinese envoy was here. The Chinese envoy was here. Yes, the Chinese envoy was here. But left in his broken heart and pagoda. makes uh, an audience. Very Could you come nice, back in, you. John? John Cale in the Chinese Envoy. Now, you've been right up front of various things with Velvet Underground, as you said, you worked as an A&R man. In, uh, I think it was 74, around about the time punk started to become big in England, you went back from America, back to the UK. Was that because you were ahead of it and you wanted to be there when it all happened? Or did well, you was, have a vibe? Or you're talking about 72. But it, it's further back than that, right? Um... I think you're talking about uh, the beginning of, of the island relationship with with June June first, and uh, the, where I got to perform for the first time. I mean, when working with the Velvet Underground is one thing. You, you're you're a side man, uh -huh. and uh, you learn a certain amount about what you're going to do on stage, but not very much unless you're a front man. Right. So doing the doing June first, where you did Harper Hotel, is where you stand up on your own and you do do something. The only experience I had of standing up on my own before was to do was to play viola concertos or to conduct or to... Because you did... Uh, the, to the classical side, right, yeah. yeah. And um, so you're talking about a different milieu entirely. Yeah, I'm just thinking that out of having moved from Wales, where we were born, to the UK, then to America to study, and it come about the time that all that new wave stuff started to hit, that you all of a sudden went back to the UK. I thought you might have had some sort of feeling that that was about to happen. You well, it was to be it, there at the time. Well, there was a lot of work that I did with Miles Copeland for for Illegal Records and started right. his label yeah. with Squeeze and, and yeah. uh, Sham Sixty Nine, and uh, that was about as far as it went. I mean, it, I, I think it's it's one of those. I mean, what was going on in England at that time was was really what Jonathan had been doing about two years earlier. Uh huh. Really. So well, Berserkly Records, did you work as a and for Berserkly? No, not at all, not at all. I knew the people at Berserkly, but... It was prior to that, again. Well, Jonathan's personal relationship with, with the people at Berserkly really stood him good stead. Yeah. And whatever confusion happened at Warner Brothers, you know, that, that, that was painful for everyone in concern, mm -hmm. because it, it, was, it was frustrating as hell to, to, to not have Pablo Picasso and hospital and all of that s stuff not come out. Right. Now, how come the G2 decided to do this tour? Has this happened before in any other place in the world, or is this the first time you've actually worked together on a stage? Well, it's just a musical bump, not a collision. Yeah, a small touch. Yes. But a beautiful one, if that's any indication.